All right. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Louise, the Director of Cybersecurity at Arnet. She is responsible, or her and her team, are responsible for all the security, both internally and externally. She's got 20 years' experience in this industry, and she's also a bushwalker. So, please welcome Louise. Thanks very much. Um, so, this, um, in our session today, we'll have two speakers talking up and giving their presentations. The first speaker will be Chris Wiley. It's my great pleasure to work with Chris once again. Um, Chris comes to us from Arnet. He started at the start of the year, and he was come from the University of Sydney. Um, has an awesome background, so over to you, Chris. All right, so people tend to say that these kind of sessions should start with a joke. And so I thought of telling you a UDP joke, but I wasn't sure that you'd get it. <laughs> uh, so as Louise mentioned, go, move. All right. I worked for the Sydney University for a bit over 10 years. I started in the help desk before uh, moving over into the information security team, uh, running security devices and contending with Dave here. Um, I ended up in the networking team and yeah, it's kind of my background and it's how I wound up in, on it. So I'm going to talk to you today about denial of service, right? Um, we tend to define denial of service into three different categories, or categorized into three different categories. Um, we've got our volumetric attacks, where you just kind of shove as much traffic at a pipe as you can, hoping to shut it down. Um, we've got state exhaustion attacks, which are targeted at stateful devices, just something that allocates memory to trying to keep track of TCP or UDP sessions or something, right? And if we can shove enough sessions into that, then nothing more is going to fit and the network kind of falls over, right? Um, and then we've got application attacks, which are when you send traffic to an application that it can't really process and it gets confused and it falls over into a giant screaming heap. Today, whoop, go. Right, today I'm going to focus on volumetric attacks. Um, they're the most prolific type of attack. They constitute about two-thirds to three-quarters of the attacks that we see in the world. And they're probably the most interesting and relevant to this group. So historically, volumetric attacks have been accomplished through amplification. Uh, amplification is when you talk to a public-facing UDP service um, and you spoof the source address to be your victim source address, right? Um, so I probably should have highlighted this in red, but you can see here me querying the Google public cache, and I send a 64-byte packet to it, and I get almost 800 bytes back. So if I put my victim's address in there, then I'm getting about 12 to 1 amplification. Um, this is a pretty simple example. Um, you can get this up to about 50 times with DNS. You can get it over 500 times with some other protocols, right? So if you're getting OSIRT alerts about open DNS or open NTP or something, this is why they care, and this is why you should probably care too. Um, last year we saw a pivot away from this kind of thing. So this kind of thing is still super common, but last year we saw the growth of IoT kind of make its way into the denial of service sphere. Um, so when I'm talking about IoT here, I'm going to next slide now. Okay, there's no present of you, so this might be a little bit stilted. Um, so when I'm talking about IoT here, I'm mostly talking about layer three devices. If you're looking at the sensors and Sigfox and LoRaWAN and stuff like that, um, Nick's going to be talking about those later. Those don't really fall into this category. This is your simple, I've got a Unix kernel in a box and I connect it to my network. Um, mostly these are home devices, CCTV cameras, DVRs, smart TVs, things of that nature. Um, and they have a, a couple of traits that makes them attractive for this kind of work. They have default passwords that are well known and people rarely change them. Uh, People don't really patch them. They don't tie into a WSUS server or Ahel or anything like that. Um, so they kind of just sit there until someone comes and pokes them. They are connected online all the time. So where a home computer might get shut off or put to sleep or taken out if it's a laptop or something, these devices are really stable. They sit in the same IP address. They're online all the time. Um, and most of them come with UPnP. So they helpfully reach out to the user's home router and say, hey, can you forward this port to me? 
and then you've got a default passworded, unpatched Linux box accessible from the internet. Um, outside of home users, obviously, we've got smart campus devices. You remove the UPnP type thing, but campuses are going crazy for these IoT devices, right? Wiring up everything from light bulbs to light switches, and I'm not really sure why we have light bulbs and light switches, but it's important. Um, and projectors and smart TVs and uh, screens and microwaves and ceiling fans and all sorts of stuff, right? Um, so the first big IoT botnet that kind of hit the news was the Mirai botnet. And that was an attack on Krebs. And it peaked at about 620 gigabits per second, which is why it got people's attention. Um, unlike the previous attacks that were relying on UDP amplification, this one was kind of interesting because it just involved throwing a large amount of GRE traffic at the website and hoping it would go away. Um, after the attack on Krebs, the author actually dropped the source code for it online, which means that everyone has it, but also meant that we could kind of dig through it and find out how it spread and what it did. And it targeted CCTVs and DVRs. It used Telnet to find them, and it had 68 sets of username and passwords, and that's all it really needed in order to summon up 620-ish gigabits of denial of service traffic, right? Um, later last year, after the source code was dropped, we saw a large Mirai botnet team up with a large Bashlight botnet and launch an attack against Dyn DNS. Um, and this one peaked at 1.2 terabits per second. Um, they attacked it in a couple of waves and they caused significant disruption to a number of large players, so Amazon and Visa and PayPal and uh, HBO and Netflix and a bunch of other people, right? So it's kind of terrifying, right? We hear numbers like 620 gigabits and 1.2 terabits and, you know, we kind of freak out a bit. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit of a story now. Uh, it's going to change this a little bit, maybe, hopefully. Um, so this story takes place in the US University. This is one of our US colleagues. Um, and the story starts with a phone call to the help desk. Users are experiencing general network slowness. So the help desk does the normal sorts of things, right? They do speed tests and everything's looking fine and they can't really find any problems. They're like, eh, I don't know. But the calls keep coming in and by nine o'clock at night, they've kind of noticed that DNS is not really responding well and they decide that they'll call an incident and get someone on the phone and make them work at nine o'clock. So that person, they feed that information to the person, the person checks the DNS logs and they just see seafood domains, like just looking at the logs, it's full of seafood domains, right? Um, they've got a retainer company for doing security forensics work, and they feel at this point that the incident is fishy enough to warrant being pushed out to that team. So they <laughs> I like bad jokes, sue me. Um, so they bundle up all the DNS and firewall logs and a bunch of other forensic information, and they chuck it over to that team, um, and the next day they come back and they tell the following story. They've got a bit over 5,000 devices on campus that are querying a couple of thousand different domains, seafood related domains, that all resolve to about 15 IP addresses. And the devices are then trying to hammer those IP addresses. Um, so contextualizing this against the network, they realize pretty quickly that this is their IoT network. So they'd segmented IoT away and they'd connected everything they possibly could, right? They thought that IoT Smart Campus was the best thing since sliced bread and somehow a botnet had gone in there and it had gone rampant either breaking into devices with unchanged passwords or brute forcing weak credentials and then it had changed all the passwords behind it. So they started to panic a bit at this stage, right? Because they have over 5,000 devices that they've lost control of and they're not really sure what to do. Um, they managed to hack their way out of it. Um, it takes them a while and it's pretty disruptive, right? And the whole time that they're trying to fix this problem, their DNS service is not working properly. Um, and they were worried that if they just cut the devices off, that they'd lose the ability to triage the problem, right? Then they just have 5,000 bricks that they couldn't connect to and they just have to hope for the best that you know, something would go wrong. Um, so what can we do about this kind of problem, right? Um, 
So if you're going to start looking at this, so obviously you can hire professionals, right? And professionals are probably a great idea. But if you're the DIY kind of person, you want to do some investigation yourself, uh, here's my recommendations. Um, so there's a couple of tools that you can use to do your investigative work. And the first and probably one of the best tools is Shodan. If you don't know about Shodan, I really suggest you have a look into it. Um, it's a bunch of security uh, professionals, I guess they're probably professionals, um, that scan the internet and collect banner information for whatever they can find, right? And you can search on here for keywords in banners or networks. Um, it's free. You can, if you sign up, you can get API keys and you can pull information down so you can write scripts that pulls down information for your organization to find out what the internet sees. Um, and you can track it over time. So if new devices start popping up, then this will help you find them. Um, if doing that yourself seems a bit daunting and you've got a really small network, um, Bullguard released a site called IoT Scanner. It'll take the uh, address that you hit it from. So if you're going through an external proxy or something, it's probably not going to work. But if you go directly to this site, it will actually go and check Shodan for you and find out if you've got botnet kind of things, right? Um, You've also got some commercial vendors like Encapsula who threw up this after Mirai dropped and they'll scan from outside. Um, this is free because they're trying to drum up business for their uh, DDoS mitigation stuff, but you can use it and then not pay them for DDoS mitigation if you want, right? Just <laughs> helping you to find your attack surface. All right. there we go. Um, so both of those, Shodan and Encapsula, are looking at the internet view, right? But our US colleagues had a nice segmented internal network and all the things wrong internal IP addresses, right? So if you want to have a look around, the Metasploit team out of Rapid7 actually developed tooling that they put up on GitHub, anyone can grab it, um, called IoT Scanner. So this is kind of nifty. It actually has a number of username and passwords that they sort of maintain. Um, this targets 80 and 443 uh, rather than the Telnet that uh, Mirai was targeting, but it's looking for vulnerable devices that they can log in and just alerting them to, alerting you to them. Um, if you want to check SSH or Telnet, then Metasploit has modules that allow you to do that as well, right? You can grab the username password list off the internet, feed them into the Metasploit module, and scan around and see if you can log into stuff. All right, so in theory, now you've done some investigation work and you have a picture of uh, where these devices are. Um, so what do we do about them, right? So the first thing I know, the security guy is going to recommend that you implement some kind of segmentation, right? But I'm going to do it anyway. So from this context, it doesn't have to be network segmentation, right? Just anything that's going to allow you to centrally define and build policies that help you to police these devices, right? So you can put them in a VRF. Um, if you do that kind of thing, you're going to need to continually go back to the investigation phase because uh, shadow IT or who knows are going to go and plug whatever the hell they want into the network um, and you're going to still wind up with these devices in the user ranges, right? You can also use more fancy pants advanced technologies like SDN or ICE, some kind of tagging engine to do it. You can put them in VLANs. You could even have your DHCP server respond with a specific sub-range within your DNS scope for certain manufacturer NICs or something. You know, right? There's a lot of ways to skin this cat, but you, you kind of need to be able to identify them centrally so that you can do things like build oh, oh, firewall rules uh, or some kind of access control. Um, the botnets are valuable because they can DOS people. And while they're likely to DOS your infrastructure on the way to doing that, that's not really the end goal. If you can prevent them from talking to the internet, they're going to lose a lot of value for the people who want to propagate them, right? Um, and you also get the side effect of hopefully cutting them off from their CNC servers so that if you do get the botnet in your network, they're not going to be able to receive the commands in order to knock things over. It's not just the internet, though. You need to be really careful of what internal services you allow these things to talk to because you're going to have a lot of these devices and they can generate a lot of traffic really quickly. Um, and unless, you're, unless you have a lot of money, you probably haven't resourced your internal 
um, support devices in order to cope with the load that the IoT can develop, uh, can generate. So that's DNS servers, or maybe you've got proxy servers, SOX proxies, or explicit proxies or something. Um, it might be mail gateways. Um, we're not seeing them being used for spam, but they very easily could be. So really have a think about the kind of impact they're going to have on your services that your users rely on. Um, you can also build alerting on them, right? So once you have them identified, these devices tend to have really small and really predictable amounts of traffic. And deviations from that probably warrant uh, ec ec extra investigation. Um, this could even just be as simple as having a report of the IoT devices mailed to someone and just having them eyeball it for size, right? Because if these things suddenly go from generating about 10 pages of logs to generating 100 pages of logs, you know that something's gone on. Uh, I didn't mention changing passwords, but I figure I probably shouldn't have to, right? <laughs> okay, good. The last thing that I'd recommend you do is actually have a chat with your security team. If you start scanning your network and trying to log into devices that you may or may not own, there's a number of complications that go along with that. Um, so go and have a chat to them. Make sure that they've got your back when you go doing this and see what they can authorize you to do as mitigation. I mean, maybe they're going to be comfortable with any devices you find with uh, default passwords. You're just dropping them off the network or something, right? Um, so they're going to be able to help you with your mitigation strategies as well. Uh, all right, so I think that that's me out at this stage. Uh, if you're doing something cool with IoT uh, or you want to find out how the un US University got their way out of their problems uh, or anything else, then come talk to me at lunch. Um, but now I'm going to hand over to Neil.